Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. Today's module will discuss silage additives. Our learning objectives, by the end of this presentation, you should be able to, one, compare types of forage additives, understand how silage inoculants improve forage quality, identify factors that impact silage inoculant success, and analyze the economics of silage inoculants. There are a number of different additives we can add to silages to enhance fermentation. Bacteria, the goal there is to control fermentation. To add nutrients such as molasses, whey, urea, and or ground corn and barley to add nutrients to enhance feedstuffs for the bacteria to ferment. Organic acids can pickle the forage, drop the pH, and prevent the formation of mold. Enzymes to help break down nutrients and ammonia, which is a mold inhibitor. So we have several different additives that we can consider when we're in siling. Looking at the 2014 Hordes Dairyman Market Survey, they do check on additive use in the U.S. from their readers. About 27% indicated they were using an inoculant preservative. I think that number might be a little higher than that because many of the custom harvesters put that on automatically as part of their product. The cost, about $2,700 is the typical expenditure for a producer to treat his silages. Which crops were they inoculating? Alfalfa silage at 76%. Corn silage, even a little bit higher, 83%. High moisture corn at 32%. And baled hay. In the survey was, well, why did you use it? And the four most popular answers were less heating, dry matter recovery improvement, improved fiber digestibility, and maintain protein quality. There are two types of inoculants. One is a homofermentative product. In this case, one mole of glucose breaks down to two moles of lactic acid. And you can see the list of typical bacteria that enhance that type of fermentation. They are listed there for you. So these are kind of the good guys, you might say. These are fast-growing lactic acid fermenters. And, of course, by putting in more than one source, you may get a synergism meaning that uh, they work better in, con- in conjunction because some will be more active under acid conditions, some will be more effective in drier silages. The second type is heterofermentative product. In this case, one mole of glucose breaks down to one lactic acid, one acetic acid, and carbon dioxide. That's a little bit of a problem. We lose some carbon there that's no longer in, in the feed itself. And again, lactobacillus buchneri and propiobacter strains are typical of this category. These products will stabilize silage at feed out or avoid secondary fermentation. And of course, the product there is acetic acid. Acetic acid is an antifungal product which retards yeast growth. And therefore, once the yeast will do is convert the lactic acid and break it down. And that therefore allows mold growth. So that's the reason we'd be looking at a heterofermentative product. Actually, if you look at the research, there are several generations of products here. The first generation was the homolactic bacteria, abbreviated as LAB, and you'll see this pop up several times during the presentation. The second generation products that came on the market included the LAB product plus the heterofermentative bacteria, and these are primarily those crops that need that protection at feed-out time, uh, high-moisture corn, some of the cereal grains. The third generation products that are coming on the market now includes phase one and two products, but now may contain enzymes. These enzymes may degrade fibers such as uh, these acids that lock up some of the uh, the nutrients there, starch that makes some of the feed more available, and of course proteins that make it a little more available for the bacteria as well. So what are the factors that are going to determine if your product is going to work? Well, the population of LABs is very important, and the research has defined this to be about 100,000 colony-forming units, known as CFU, per gram of wet silage. If you go to the heteroformic product, sometimes this will be three or four times higher in those populations because they need to be able to compete. You have to determine, do you need acetic acid? That's an important question. If not, you may stay with the HOMO product. Next, what is the nature of the sides being in silage? How wet, how dry, how much water, soluble carbohydrates, i.e. sugars, do you have there? And what is the stage of maturity? Next, you may see some inoculants that are crop-specific. And some companies have very unique bacteria for grass silage versus legume silage versus corn silage. So check with your people there. And finally, check on aerobic stability. Basically, it says, how many hours does it take to increase 1 degree centigrade at the 20 centimeter depth. This shows what is supposed to happen with a good inoculant. The green is the control silage or the untreated silage. The red squares would be your treated or inoculated silage. And so what the bacteria do is enhance the fermentation profile. 
So you can see we get down to a lower pH quicker. That means less heating, less dry matter losses, and improved digestibility because retain more of the digestible nutrients. That is what you're trying to achieve when you put an inoculant in your silages. A quick review of some research with corn silage, 18 peer-reviewed studies by Washington State University scientists. You can see here the major differences are going to be statistically dry matter recovery, about a 3% improvement in dry matter recovery. What does that mean if you're a producer? You need 3% fewer acres. So instead of harvesting 100 acres of corn silage, 97 will give you the same amount of feed. Next, you can see a statistically significant improvement in dry matter digestibility, which means we have more of the digestible nutrients that were not utilized by the bacteria during the fermentation process, and that's nearly 2%. Maybe you want to call that energy or TDN. The milk number is not statistically significant, but of course it goes the right direction as well. Next, we look at economic society inoculants. Using that data set that uh, came from Washington State, that 3% improvement in dry matter recovery and the 2% increase in digestibility using a cost of $1 per treated ton of corn silage, and that is quite variable. That can go anywhere from $0.60 cents to over $3 a ton. But using these three variables, not the milk, the benefit-to-cost ratio was 3 to 1. If I take those extra nutrients and put them through high-producing cows, Kansas State then says that's an 8-to-1 return on your investment. This table comes from uh, Delaware and Wisconsin looking at what the fermentation profile should look like. You can see we'll just come down corn silage. The other ones apply as well. You can see dry matters. That's the range we'd like to be in. The pH should be on corn silage under 4 under four. Notice the other ones are slightly higher. Higher levels of lactic acid in the corn silage because of the starch availability. Acetic acid will depend if you've got a homo or heterofermentating product in the fermentation profile. Generally, propionic acid is low. Butyric acid is low. Ethanol should be low. You don't want to go to ethanol. You're not making moonshine here. The ammonia levels should be low, but notice in the grass silage it's quite a bit higher, and that's because you see some solubilization of those nitrogen compounds there. And the lactic acid, acetic acid ratio should be about 3 to 1, and lactic acid should be about 70% of the total VFAs produced in the silo itself. Of course, it was very a little bit depending, again, on the crop and also the type of inoculant that you're using. So let's look at our silage checklist very quickly as we start summarizing. Here is the breakdown that we use at Illinois. What is the function of silage inoculants? And you can read those quickly. I will not read those to you. We already discussed most of them as well. Number two, what's the level that you want to look at? And there again, we discussed that, but in a nice summary, usually the lactobacillus buchneri is about uh, four times higher than that. The cost we discussed depends on which product you're using and the amount you're putting on, but of course, anywhere from $1 to $3 per ton. Benefit to cost ratio, I settled on 6 to 1. You can argue that depending on milk production responses. Strategies, I'm going to apply to all wet silages, haylages, corn silage, high moisture corn, especially first and last cutting because sometimes the natural bacteria are reduced there due to wet growing conditions and or frost damage there and under situations in which we expect to see poor fermentation occurring on the crop. We are recommending silage inoculants and additives to be used on crops that are at risk. So what's our take-home message? Silage additives can improve forage quality. I think we demonstrated that. You need to understand how each additive functions and if you need it on your farm. Bacteria inoculants can be effectively used based on research. And if you're buying a product, ask for that research there. And finally, understand how and why inoculants can function on your farm. Thanks. Have a great day.